Who knows? Those, those. Hey, uh, welcome to Bigfoot Press, another episode with um, Joe and myself. And we have, Woo! man, a really special guest um, who is joining us this this evening to uh, share his story. Uh, obviously, the premise for this podcast is that uh, we believe that everyone has a significant story. And so we want to uh, provide that opportunity for not only the person telling the story, but for you, the audience who's tuning in to glean from from their experience. Um, so uh, it is our pleasure to introduce you to our guest this morning, or this this this, this evening. Morning. Oh man, this morning, <laughs> rock yeah. and roll. Oh, he looks fresh, <laughs> like he's uh, just popped out of bed this morning. But um, it's the evening, and his name is Don Van <laughs> Good evening. How's it going, man? Konnichiwa. Very good, thank you. Very man. good to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. Man, thanks for coming uh, along. I know. That we sort of know each other outside of the podcast, and uh, I'm really excited for our listeners and our watchers to uh, hear what you've been through, and um, it's quite fascinating, actually. Like, um, but we'll touch on a few of those things. But before we sort of get to that, I just want you to have a look at the screen there and uh, give us your thoughts on this video. Just a bit of fun to, to kick things off, to, <coughs> to loosen things up. On the weekend, yeah, there's a bit of a, a tragedy. Uh, something took place in Australia that, um, yeah, I think really shook the core of yeah. Of uh, this place in the Spanish, so there was a flatline. Is, is it going to make <coughs> me emotional? It might make you emotional, yeah. actually. Okay. It was a flatlining um, moment. It takes quite a bit to do that, so. Well, I I feel like this will make you emotional. Oh, okay. Keep your eyes peeled on this, and then uh, we'll get your thoughts after it. Oh, I didn't realize you were that's atrocious. <laughs> There's every wallaby fan <laughs> right now. <laughs> Let's have your thoughts, Dom. What do you think of that? The the one eyed Crusaders fan and me just leaps for joy when I see that. I, I do love the All Blacks, but particularly when the Crusaders within the All Blacks step up like that. <laughs> Someone like Scott Barrett, who we just know, he's our homeboy. He steps up to do it for the country as well as the region. It's just so beautiful. A one eyed Crusaders fan? Very much so. Sorry, Man. I don't, don't have much time Man. for the other franchise. This might be a short podcast. <laughs> I know Crusaders fan. Actually, no, I've, I've uh, grown to like the Brumbies this year as well. Really like the Brumbies. Oh, it's I just not getting any Man, better. Man, that's like <laughs> going from different <laughs> islands to a different country. <laughs> wow. I, wow. Feel, I had to adopt one like now that Australia is like a second home. I had to pick an Aussie team. And then um, someone from within a class I teach, a uh, relative place with the Brumbies. And yeah, jumped on that bandwagon a bit this year. Wow. Oh, nice. Wow. So is, is there anyone in the Brumbies that stands out for you oh. other oh. than S- Scotty Barrett? Oh, I'm trying <laughs> to think. Oh, Corey Tool. Man, on the wing, he is so quick and um, pretty unpredictable. And I, I don't really understand why the Wallabies haven't counted on him as much as I think they should. Well, there you have it. But if um, Mr. Jones had paid attention Man. you know, yeah, to, yeah. To, to every Kiwi supporter um, on who should be picked, maybe it would have been... Um, by less than um, 100 points. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you're a Crusaders fan, then mm. I've prepared a video for you. Oh, yeah. Because I know you love the Crusaders. and um, I hope it's not like yeah. that. Yeah. Here we go. Spencer. Ooh. What is this? <laughs> Look at the Crusaders. Oh, yeah. You know what? I'm going to be like a commentator for this. See, that sort of... Did that make you emotional? <laughs> it made me emotional. You know, that touched me there. What, what the <laughs> Wait, show me again. <laughs> it so touched me there. <laughs> because like it wasn't on me earlier, people were having Michael Bolton moments. Like, here we go. Anyway, the, the fact that it would have passed over anyone that was born after 1985. Is yeah, that video is just as old as you, Don. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say. like, I, I can't say I recognise it. When I was a kid, we used to go to... Um, you, hey, you don't want to see it. That's <laughs> what you don't want to do. I was just pretend I'll block out yeah, those yeah. years. We just went. <laughs> there actually haven't been that many since I've been alive. But. Been, it just keeps going. <laughs> All right, Don, we're, 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 we're we'll let's get straight to the... the yeah, yeah, let's, let's yeah. put that aside yeah, because okay. uh, we're on topic. <laughs> Dom, tell us... Um, I know you have a significant story. I've heard uh, some of it. Uh, we get the pleasure tonight to hear you sort of uh, unpack it for not only us but everyone listening. You're a, you're a, obviously as a Crusaders fan. You're from Christchurch. Yeah, that's right. Born and bred. Sea town. Yeah, Christchurch Women's Hospital. That's no longer there. Christchurch Women's Hospital. Yeah, yeah. Wow. What's it called? Oh no, no, no it's a, it's just a um, grass field now. They haven't built oh, anything wow. on it since, and I think they knocked it down before the earthquakes. Wow. So, yeah. Like oh well, Christchurch, another empty space in the middle of town. But man, tell us about your upbringing. Where, where are you from? How old are you? What's mum and dad? Where, are you a first, second, third generation Kiwi? 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or fourth generation Aussie. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Brumbies. <Yeah>. Brumbies. <laughs> Sixth generation yeah, Brumbies. Yeah, it's just got Sixth like a little bit of Canberra sprinkled <laughs> in there as well. First generation uh, trader. Yeah, <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, yeah. So um, basically, yeah, born in Christchurch um, to two really awesome parents. Mm. Um, my mum was, you know, your classic sort of Caucasian Kiwi mix of like English and French and Austrian and all, all these different parts of uh, Europe. But she was born and bred in Christchurch as well. Um, my dad, he moved to Christchurch when he was two years old in mm. the 50s on a boat from, from the Netherlands. Wow. Yeah, so um, that's where my funny last name Van Uden comes from, of Uden, the place. And um, yeah, to, to be honest, I didn't really know too much of the Dutch part of my culture growing up except for my Oma, um, and mm-hmm. she was the only living grandparent I had um, growing up. So oh, I was wow. very close with her. Um, she was a very, you know, strong Dutch woman, um, strong Dutch Catholic woman. And so, uh, yeah, we used to spend Saturdays. I'd go play my soccer match. Dad and I would go pick up McDonald's, would visit Orma, um, mm. have quality time with her for nice. about an hour. And, um, yeah, basically I uh, was in Christchurch until 2011 when we had the earthquakes and then came across to Australia for about a year after that went back to Christchurch again until um, the end of 2018, the end of my first year of uni. And then after that, moved back to Australia. And um, this time a bit more long term, just into my fourth year now. So, Brother, one of the things that I, uh, because we went here in Australia, one of the things that really um, got me was your level of, so you speak a number of languages. Uh, Like your te reo is pretty, pretty on. Yeah. Do you want to share your me or? Oh, I don't know how far I could go off the top of my head. I joined a yeah, give it a go. Yeah, go, 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 go. I was pretty impressed when, when you dropped that one on me. I was like confused, and then you spoke another language, which, um, yeah, yeah. Give yeah. us, give us. A, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, I felt like that me. halfback. Why makariri took an hour? Ko aurangi, ko ana toku fire, ko Chris. I don't know why I said that in an accent. Ko Chris toku matua. And then I guess I'll wrap it up. Not Bro, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. That's, that is awesome. <laughs> that is yeah. awesome. There's a few more details that I've forgotten, but yeah, yeah I think we're quite um, privileged in school. It, it was very much intertwined with everything we did in primary school. We had um, Fire Sue, who was our Maori teacher at Hillview, and um, yeah, her passion really flowed through. Man, really. shout out to Hillview. Is that your high school or your uh, primary? Primary school. Yeah, like prep to year nine. Um, mm. So yeah. Like, big shout out to Hillview. It was a really awesome school. Did a final three years at uh, Middleton Grange in Christchurch. And yeah. That's crazy good, man. It's crazy good. I I love the fact that, like, you know, you guys embraced that part. And I think that's that's one thing that's also making about New Zealand. Yeah. Um, Yeah, Is is, is the way, like, you know, you guys have been able to embrace it. And just hearing you say it, like, like I wouldn't, like, I I can piece together a few things here and there, but... You know, well done, man. Yeah, right, that was, thank you. Yeah, was, sorry <laughs> to put you on the spot. We actually didn't even discuss this, <laughs> yeah. so I apologize right. for for that, Dom. But I you, wasn't sure if you were going to go uh, Chinese. Oh well, yeah, <laughs> tell us about your Chinese, man, because you're 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 pretty fluent compared to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, learning Chinese has been a really awesome um, experience. I actually sort of picked it up on accident in my first year of uni, mm. so I was all set to learn Spanish because um, I had a sponsored child in South America and I was like, I want to communicate with them in Spanish. Um, But anyway, my girlfriend at the time, just before that um, first year of uni started, Mm -hmm. we went to Singapore because that's where her family was from. And I was just blown away by Singapore. I loved the culture. I loved the food. I I love, I guess, the drive of the people as well. And I thought, um, I guess, living in urban New Zealand or um, urban Australia as well, learning Chinese would probably help my life a bit more holistically than, than learning Spanish. So I kind of fell into um, Chinese as a, as a, within my first year of uni. I uh, did both those first year units and didn't do any more formal study, but went to China for um, three weeks and have a lot of Chinese friends as well that um, yeah sometimes get to practice some conversation. Yeah, I was, was going to ask, like, you know, like, would there have been, like, a, a, a time when you've had to apply, you know, that, you know, straight off the cuff, especially, like, and so you went to China. Yeah, yeah. How do they, like, <clears throat> obviously, like, you know, we, we tend to pick up on, like, you know, if, if they're broken English, but someone that's speaking that mm-hmm. doesn't pick up on that. 
So we don't pick up on our accent, yes. you know, our yeah. frailties, right? But, you know, when you were talking to them about it, you know, how, would you, like, did, did, did they boost your confidence? Did they boost your confidence knowing that you weren't, you know, fluent or that you're not of, like, you know, Chinese speaking, like, growing up or whatnot? Yeah, yeah. I was pretty blown away by their um, positive reception of me even giving it a go. Because yeah. I don't know if you know, but Chinese has four tones and the way that you say um, a word can totally impact its meaning. So the word ma um, can be put at the end of any sentence to make it a question. So ma by itself can be like a question mark. Mm. Then if you say like ma in a higher tone or ma ma, then it's like your mum. And if you say ma in sort of a short, sharp tone, it means a horse. So Wait, <laughs> oh, I did not see that coming. <laughs> yeah. I did not see that coming. I honestly did not see <laughs> so that like yeah, and, coming. and by using one word you could be like interchanging between asking a question, talking about your mum or talking about a horse. So a pretty dangerous combination. I know, if right? You wow. Get around the wrong way. Like I, I was thinking okay, you go ma, you know, be like mum is mama, grandma, and then ma maybe like great great grandma but a horse. Yeah, you know? yeah, <laughs> that uh, that was left field. For <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny, and so those tones made me quite nervous when I was speaking it. And when I was originally learning it, I was so intentional about getting every single tone right. But I think also in the wider sense, you know, the way I've described it makes it sound pretty killer if you screw one tone yeah. up. But if you're talking in a whole sentence and you get like a couple mm. tones wrong, then people are still going to be able to understand. Yeah what you have to say. Yep. And the, the best I probably have was I was actually working at Countdown Supermarket in New Zealand, just in the suburbs of Christchurch. And for whatever reason, we had a really large um, Chinese speaking tour group come through. And um, I was the only employee that could even say a sentence and we'd sort of done a unit in uni on groceries. So I was able to say things like 500 grams of grapes will cost this amount and things. Anyway, I said one sentence and then the whole tour group was that lined up to go through my checkout and they were so excited to like fire all these different phrases at me and I was totally overwhelmed. It was one of those things that like I could sort of say what I wanted to say but not take in everything that they yeah. wanted to say but they were so happy. It made me really happy and that's probably my favorite yeah, experience. Awesome. Yeah, I could just imagine times. how much fun, like, you know, just the vibe, right, there and then, you know, and I, I guess, look, I, I get a bit excited too, like sometimes if, you know, when, when it's like, uh, you know, speaking in, in Samoan and, you know, and I'm able to respond accordingly. Yeah. Like not, I'm not fluent, you know, by no means am I fluent in my, you know, mother tongue in Samoan and, and I wish I would be better at it. But, you know, when you respond in kind and then you see their faces light up and they're like, cool, because they can, they can go ahead and, yeah. and just see this. So you would have seen like just a whole line of them. So you set yourself up first and foremost. You set yourself up for a whole line of just like everyone else in the counter is going, what, um, yeah. nah, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. Nah, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. Take them all. You, yeah. take them all. you could but claim commission on those grapes, man. <laughs> Greatest sale of grapes. Oh. <laughs> countdown. RIP countdown, by the way. Yeah. It's, oh, uh, yeah. It's all it's over. Gone. Wait, yeah. what? For real? Yeah. Gone. Countdowns now Woolworths again. In yeah. New Zealand, because it went Woolworths, Countdown, and now back to Woolworths again. Mm. Wow. But yeah, you know what the best part about working there was? Was that your Countdown student discount worked in New Zealand and in Australia as well. So when you're on oh, holiday, wow. you still got all your groceries nice and cheap. No, no way. way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I know that Woolies in South Africa. Yeah. I don't know if it would go Connected? that far. No. But yeah, maybe. Wait, they have a Woolies in South Africa? I know, man. I, I didn't even... I, I was... Yeah, they that was a bit field as the horse that I just encountered. Your mum's horse? <laughs> <laughs> My mum's horse. <laughs> and there it goes. A Woolies in South Africa. I'd yeah, yeah. Apparently it's really fancy. Apparently it's more like a department store, like a David Jones or, or Mike. Yeah. Wait, actual? Yeah, yeah. So Woolies leaves our shores and goes over there and creates themselves, or like, you know, makes themselves an Audi. Or, or even even uh, higher. Oh, Myers. Meyer, yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's where Myers has gone. Totally reinvent the wheel. <laughs> R.I.P. Myers. <laughs> Uptown. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Shout out Uptown. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you, you've got, man, you've got these languages under your belt. Um, it's and, crazy good. Yeah, one of the things that I've I encountered about you, uh, Dom, is that you have just a, man, you just have a knack of making everyone feel welcome, like, around you. 
and um, yeah. uh, and we'll get to sort of where those attributes come from and qualities and and what values you hold dear because I, I I do believe they're an expression or values that you hold really yeah. close to you. But um, going back to your childhood, like man, tell us about the earthquakes. Tell yeah. us about the earthquakes in your experience. Yeah, sure things. The earthquakes were just a really really crazy time. So we had three major earth in a row in Christchurch. Yeah. So the first one was in September 2010 and that was a magnitude 7 earthquake and it was a little bit further out of the city so the damage wasn't as bad. So that one was at 4:30 in the morning. It mm -hmm. was um mum and I in the house and I I just remember the house shaking so violently and I I just remember thinking, "Oh, this must be what an earthquake is." Because in New Zealand, as crazy as it is, you do earthquake drills in school, yeah. just in the middle of class. They say earthquake drop and you have to get under your desk, you have to hold the legs, you have to push the chair out and just wait until yeah. the teacher The says, legs of the desk. Yeah, 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 yeah. The teacher says wait till the earthquake's over. That's exactly what I did. And my mum ran into my room like freaking out like where's Dom? But I was under the table holding the legs and all oh, prepared, yeah. <laughs> ready to go. So wow. yeah, that was round one. And then um, round two was in February, which I guess you could say is, is the notable or, or famous earthquake. Yeah. So that one was <coughs> 6.3 magnitude, so a bit smaller, but right underneath Christchurch City in a very shallow depth in terms of earthquakes. So that one I was in year six at school. It was the middle of Tuesday lunchtime, I believe. And um, yeah, I remember I must have just been <coughs> walking from one game to another or, or A to B because I don't remember being around other people, but the ground just started shaking like so ferociously, side to side, up and down. And um, again, just had to go hands and knees right then and there. But I remember bouncing on the concrete wow. on my hands mm. and knees, getting wow. grazes and everything like that. And that one was chaos because um, say cracks appeared in our school that you could essentially like you know crash your bike into wow. um, on our field which was kind of like the safe place you could go um, there was liquefaction bubbling up which is like this weird mix of um, sand and and groundwater wow. so random fluid oh, is yeah. bubbling up from the ground um, the netball courts which would sort of be the other safe place all have massive cracks as well and then um, I don't know how many aftershocks there were on that day, but across I think the following five years there was about ten thousand. So ten thousand. <laughs> yep, it, w it was just crazy. So <sighs> especially wow. in those months after the earthquake, it was probably like at least twenty times a day you'd notice an earthquake. Some would be big enough to warrant a movement from you, but it was just totally unsettling because. You'd just be doing any old task and, and the ground could shake at any moment. Wow. So, <clears throat> yeah, it was pretty nuts. I remember driving from school to home through flooded streets, you know, not even sure if the car would make it through. But we lived up on a hill and I remember um, pulling up back home with dad. Mum was at work and all the bricks of our house had fallen off the, wow. the, the walls, I guess. Mm. They'd crushed one of the cars in the driveway, like totally flattened it. And it just looked like the house was going to be no more. So wow. that, that was the moment where me as an 11-year-old burst into tears thinking, you know, wow. oh wow, we're never going back into that house again. And the, was, it, was it the house that you grew up in? Yeah, essentially yeah. Um, from, from five years old. So from yeah. five to 11, that was my main home where we'd hosted a lot of other people in there as well. It was way too big for the, for the three of us. So mum mm. really used it hospitality space no, but no. yeah in that moment it really felt like it, it was gone like no. our glass house the bricks had fallen off and smashed that um the trampoline was ruined so uh, yeah dad and i had to stay in a tent on the front lawn for i think three nights Man. Um, just like uh trampoline. And yeah you as the well. whole time it's pretty scary do you even sleep like in in that situation like man that, did you Tell us, tell us how what, yeah, what you're look, thinking as an eleven year as an eleven year old because all I, all about is the fact that you know you're saying like because it's so like so far back like we you know forget you know how far back it was right mm, and yeah. you were eleven so in that moment when you were bouncing you know yeah. when you're saying that you're bouncing that gave me goosebumps because you know when you mm. think the safest place that you're taught is and you ended up in that position and you were bouncing yeah yeah and I can't even imagine being bounced like I, like. 
Oh, when I forget my ID, but, but no, nah, oh, I don't want to bounce you. But <laughs> but like being vulnerable and subject to like nature, that's that's yeah. Like yeah, no, yeah. you're right. It, yes. It's no, we'll go, we'll go back to the, the, that question that you were asking. Was what you know, Edelo, because I know you you've been reaching back in to regards to like how you felt at the time, but like mm. from that moment when like you know it happened and you got down, and then to the moment when you got to like the house, like. Can you recall how, like, the different emotions that you probably would have felt? Even, I mean, as an 11 year old, it's just all over the place, but then you would have seen dad and it would have been like, okay, dad's here. Yeah. Everything's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I think 11 is almost, uh, I guess it's not, it's not beautiful, but it's like the most ideal age could have happened, really. Mm -hmm. I think you're old enough to have an understanding that there are forces at play greater than you, yeah. but also <coughs> young enough to, to have that childlike, I guess, naivety and dependence on other people situations mm-hmm. like that. You know, like I wasn't in university and, and like lost control of my whole study schedule and exams mm-hmm. and finances, yeah. um, <clears throat> but I was still able to understand like, well, this is a really momentous event for our family and for our city. But um, yeah, I guess in those nights in the tent, lying with that i was a really worried about my dog i was mm. scared that bricks would fall yeah. off the house and hit my dog because yeah. he wasn't sleeping inside the tent um i was really worried for my mum as well because she um worked in an older private hospital in christchurch and she was the manager of the maternity ward she's still working yeah she worked wow. 72 hours straight after those wow. earthquakes just to keep the oh. um woman safe shout out to mum of it yeah yeah oh, she's incredible yeah. so incredible Ma. And um, yeah, I, I guess just thinking like, okay, so what are we going to do after, you know, all this has settled down? Like, will we ever move into this house again? Mm. I was a little bit of a nerd. Like um, my parents used to say I was the kid that would talk about the political ads on the street when um, election time would pop up and things. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the sort of nerdy part of me was listening to the radio for anything the government was saying or anything the mayor was saying just to try and make a bit of sense yeah. about what was going on. Like, were we the only city that got affected by this or was Wellington flattened as well? Because as a kid, we're always mm. told Wellington's going to have the big earthquake, not Christchurch yeah. mm. and things like that. So lots and lots of different thoughts, but I, I wouldn't say overwhelmed, probably because both my parents and and all people on our street as well really um together to help each other out which was yeah pretty special yeah man yeah and i and, and i love i love the the the, the fact that you went back to 11 mm. right and <clears throat> just just to pull it to, to the side one second like you know we are addressing like uh, you guys deal with kids you guys deal with, mm. you know, with kids. Of us are quick to like, oh, he's living. They, they'll be right. You know, there's, but you know, you were saying like, you're worried about your dog, mm. right? And then you were thinking about, you know, like, you know, mom and, and dad, dad and the things that were going on, you know, so those things are, you know, you consider a lot of us, you know, tend to like, you know, we, we see our 11 year olds, our 10 year olds, mm. we tend to like, um, just kind of like brush them off when they say things. Yeah. You know, I, I think we were guilty, like, you know, we, we know not all of us, like, you know, like you guys obviously work and, you know, and, and you guys see that and you guys acknowledge that. But for a lot of us, you know, maybe, oh, you know, when a 10 year old, 11 year old says something, we'll be like, oh, that's nice or yeah, that's yeah. really cool and kind of brush it off. Yeah. But when you say I, that, I see what you're saying. You like, know what I mean? There's a weight that they bear that we're unaware of. That, that, yeah. that we don't. Yeah. That we don't you know, even think. We don't even think. And they, like, at 11, you're thinking about your dog, right? And then, like, and mom and, you know, whatnot, yeah. you know. I don't know. It, it, it's just something that that, that really um, resonates with me, and 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 just hearing you talk about that because now I'm like even more so about my son when I have conversations with him. Mm. And like I sit down and I, you know, and he says these things, says a lot of things, and I am guilty of brushing eighty percent of that off and yeah, thinking, yeah. thinking, oh yeah, you know, yeah, you know, all, all good, son. But you know, there's there's we'll what, like you were saying, brother. But I think it's a cultural thing, Joe, as well. You reckon like, to an extent, like. <clears throat> I find that, um, yeah, I, I, you know, and, and this is purely in my own experience. Like, I think there's not much consideration given to an 11 year old in an island family. Like, in terms of, like, what are you thinking? How's it having an effect on you? Hmm. It's sort of like, get in line, you're part of this family. See yeah, yeah, what you mean? Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think we've sort of inherited that as as, you know, the 30-something-year-olds we are now. <laughs> yeah. with, with like, you know, and I found, like, yeah, there's, there's different um, 
there's certainly a different approach to children. I don't know if it's because we're sort of further along now in an age where, you know, things like smacking and, you know, like all of that stuff yeah. is highlighted. But I, I have found that there is um, a bit of weight given to uh, even, you know, preps and stuff. You know, it could be also. And, and, and like, you know, point. you know, want some comments on that and just let us know. You know, yeah. because it's, it's just something to think about, really. It is, actually. And, you know. and probably, have you ever, that's probably a good question, have you ever sat with your child and just said, hey, what's weighing on your mind or heart at the moment? Mm. Because, um, yeah, often you'll find that there's a lot that you've overlooked. And sorry, don't we're hijacking your... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I think, you know, yeah. even even the, the, the weight of uh, being concerned for your dog does some weight like that uh, is that that's yeah, a, that, that's that's that's, a real that, that's proper care factor right mm, that's yeah, that's yeah. like an emotion and that's love that you have as an 11 year old you you know that yeah. to be real mm, whereas right? if i can think of like, this never happened but if a scenario like that popped up and i was like oh dad my dogs like, ah. yeah yeah <laughs> oh worry about no, you're right like 100, 100. Don't worry about the dog. yeah, yeah. you worry about the dog he's <laughs> yeah, fine yeah, i yeah, worry about yeah, the house yeah. that's falling down i worry about yeah, yeah, yeah. anything yeah yeah I've actually never made this connection in my head, but like I work probably more with 11-year-olds at our school than any other mm. age group and perhaps that's a reason why I really enjoy working with that age bracket so much is because it was, yeah, such a massive year for me. Yeah, and oh, then, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, working with them, I think, yeah, seeing seeing their ability to have fun but think deeply and not have that sort of stubbornness yeah, that yeah, teenagers yeah. might present, it's, it's really awesome bunch to work with you, yeah you must subconsciously go towards 11 year olds because you have that yeah that massive year like i don't know <laughs> is that a thing is there science behind it but I, I don't know like well if you think about it when i started at the school like uh, as a pays person i could have really ended up in whatever grade oh are we naming like, organizations <laughs> when i started at the school as a missions worker yeah. as a nondescript this is when i started at a school shout out to my description <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, but um yeah, when I did start out in that environment, like really had free reign as to yeah. whatever sort of ministry within that school I wanted to, to put my hand to. And then, yeah, eventually just ended up mainly being year five, six, seven, really. And it's been a great ride ever since. Because, um, you know, and this is a little bit off topic, but I heard that the music that you were into when you were 14 is the genre of music that you actually carry into, like your, your in terms of likes, like... Really? You're, yeah, you're, you're more inclined to listen to that genre of music, whatever you were listening to around the developmental age of 14, 15-ish. Mm. And I think back to 14, 1994, man, and this is where you go, I wish it was a good year, <laughs> I wish it was a good year of music. <laughs> no, so well, that's, that's a year removed from like, you know, when Snoop brought out his album. And <laughs> 95 or 93. 93. Actually, yeah. you know, I used to listen to Naughty by Nature. 1993. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Anyway. Awesome. <laughs> um, 2015. Yeah, I think I loved Coldplay a lot back then. I oh, see, they're, like they're they're a decent band, man. Yeah, like I could like I could sit and just like when I'm driving, mm. and you know, uh, Coldplay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my wife, my the wife, as well, the lows well loves loves Coldplay. Yeah, shout out my wife. <laughs> Coldplay. Shout out to you, shout out to Coldplay. <laughs> Coldplay, just before you drive off the bridge. Uh, <laughs> Listen to 660 before I do that. <laughs> oh, 660 is <laughs> not too bad. Nah, nah, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, I like this stuff. Yeah, you're well, a 660 fan though. Oh, um, mm, an hey. old school 660 <coughs> fan. I don't, I'm not not a huge fan. Of oh, wait, so there's okay. Look, I'm, I'm I, I say that like they're like the Beatles or something. Like they've been around forever. But yeah, I remember when they first started out was actually around the earthquake time, and they played at our yeah. telethon. Well, really, yeah, and they were playing like drum and bass back then, and I really like that as an 11 year old. I'm there like <laughs> shaking my head. <laughs> well, the shaking wouldn't be new to you. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> shout out to 660 and. The, Making the brother shake. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. Oh, oh man. man. Oh. Sorry, Christchurch. <laughs> nah, it's all right. We, we, we need a cop of it. We, we do need a cop of it. Yeah, <laughs> you win all the rugby. It's all good. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Except yeah. for that, yeah. There was a sad year where we didn't win because um, we had to play all our home games in London. That's made, right. Made the final, played here in Brisbane and, and lost to Quade Cooper's Reds. A long range try in mm. Guinea where he shepherded mm. behind every <laughs> every Reds player. Yeah, I yeah. thought I was watching Gridiron. I was like, oh. No, there were like even like caravans parked in front of the referee when he was running around some of those other players. <laughs> 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 but, you know, obviously the ref didn't see it because of all these caravans. But, but now, nah, like, wow. 660. 660 bridges. 
Coldplay. <laughs> Bridges. <laughs> so, yeah, man, tell, tell us, like, so you're now um, 11, you're uh, three nights on the front lawn, yep. worried about your dog, and then um, and then what happens from there? Because that's, tell, yeah, tell us what happens from that point. It's a pretty beautiful story from that point, to mm. be honest. I My dad, um, yeah, is a very faithful man, and I do remember us saying some prayers on the tent because really we, we just had no clue. Where, mm. where life was heading from that point. It was totally unfamiliar. The city was wrecked. We had Aussies staying with us that we had to take to the airport. And it was honestly like a war zone airport. Like you might see if people are trying to flee a country wow. in a political situation or something. No tickets, no passports. No, it was just mania. So <clears throat> after that week, once we'd sort of resettled, um, a mutual, well, a friend of my mum, um, put out an offer to us because we were all staying in, in the tents on the front lawn. Mm. And um, we'd recently been to the wedding of my mum's friend's daughter. Yeah. Um, my mum's friend was called Rose. Her daughter was called Charlotte. Charlotte used to babysit me when I was a really little kid. Anyway, it was such a far-fetched connection because my mum's friend said, hey, Charlotte's new in-laws, her new mother and father-in-law. Wait, have I got that totally wrong? I'm just trying to make the... Family connection in my head. To Charlotte and Rosa? No, no, no. I'm just thinking, I think I've got the wrong side of the family there. Let's just rewind that. Yeah. <laughs> so mum's, oh, yeah, no, it was it was Charlotte's brother, Simon. So mum's friend Rose from work said, hey, you're the wedding of my son you've just attended. His new in-laws have a big place just out of Christchurch, probably about 25 minutes out of the city. So it felt kind of rural. Um, but they're more than happy to, to put you up for as long as you need. Wow. Now, mm. I think the incredible context of that is we'd probably said hello and made small talk at a wedding once, and yet they were willing to give up a space in their home for what ended up being at least two months wow. to us. Free access to everything, beautiful home. Uh, they, they just looked after us so incredibly wow. while... My dad took the time to strip the house of all the bricks, um, get it reinforced, work through all the insurance and things. So it was just a safe place that, um, yeah, I really do believe was an answer to our prayers. And um, I think the crazy part of that story is we moved back into the home where all the bricks had fallen off. It, it got reinforced to a point that we could live in it again. And then Christchurch had another massive earthquake in June of that year. Yeah. Same size, same location, pretty much, mm -hmm. as the February one. So anything that was half destroyed in February was written off in June. Yeah. Wow. So <coughs> my dad's best friend and his family, their house crossed that line into it's no longer safe to live in and they were sort of homeless as well for that period. Wow. So then they were all able to come and move into our house. Like I said, it was way too big for us. And then we were able to provide that for, for them um, probably for about the same length of time as well. Wow. And um, <coughs> yeah, I, I just found it such an amazing time. There were other opportunities as well. Like my um, one of my best friend's dads was a church pastor and um, they were running relief work um, in the eastern suburbs of Christchurch, which yeah. were hit particularly hard. Uh, and there were a couple of days where my friend and I were unloading helicopters with the deputy prime or uh, the leader of the opposition mm -hmm. in New Zealand and getting clean water to people wow. like that as well. Wow. So wow. I think being exposed to experiences like that at 11 as well ha has probably shaped a lot of who I am now. Man. Yes. That, that, that's incredible because it, it then goes back to 11-year-olds. Yeah. yeah. The experiences, right? shaped it for you it's shaped a lot of you know like you know how you see people how you see like events how you see occasions how you see um you know those moments of when people pay it forward yeah you know? absolutely and that's oh no, that's amazing like you know and, and being able to carry that forward and you know like you you see the, the things that are going on now like i remember going um driving over to uh, when we flew down to Christchurch, and it was that was the red zone, mm. then and that was just so eerie. Yeah, it, it is, was isn't it? eerie, and, and like, and this is coming from someone that didn't even live in Christchurch. My brother lives in Christchurch, mm. you know, yeah, and that's true. he, like, you know, it was it was just massive, right? But just going through that, and you know, when you go back, you know, now and you see things like you know, 
the memories that, that come flooding back, you know, the fact that you're like, it, it must be mixed emotions because then yeah. you get to remember as a 11 year old, you got to see all these wonderful things that also happened after the earthquake mm. and how you carried it forward. Like, what do you like feel now when you go back and like, you know, and, and see and the, the places that haven't been built, just the feels that used to be there? Yeah, yeah. T- to me personally, I think the empty spaces make me a bit sad. Because um, I know like Japan had a major earthquake in that yeah. year as well. Yeah. And if you look at the progress they've made in rebuilding versus New Zealand, obviously massive difference in resources. But uh, it just makes me sad that there's so much opportunity for things to be done, but the process has been stalled. So, so part of me, my heart breaks because I know the potential Christchurch has. I thought it was a wonderful place to grow up. And I thought, um, yeah, wonderful place to host events and, and things like that. But at the moment, I, I feel like it's it's not quite there yet, back to where it was. So the the potential a little bit breaks my heart. Yeah. But at the same time, going back, you know, it, it's home. And, and I have so many cherished memories from there, playing sport in Hagley Park on Saturday mornings. And, you know, that still happens. Um, the the rest of the people there is uh, I don't think I've found it anywhere else because we all went through that experience together, and obviously Christchurch has been through some pretty horrible experiences since as well with wildfires and the terrorist attack yeah, as well. Yeah. So um, <coughs> yeah, hasn't been an easy ride for that place by any means, but but I hold such a special place in my heart because it it is home and um, yeah, I, my roots are there. Yeah, wow. man, <coughs> wow. You saw a lot of um, you saw a, you saw a lot of yeah community and mm. and qualities and values just being played out in front of you as a young person. Yeah, you're a young you're a, an only child. Yes, yes I am. So yeah. um yeah didn't grow up with any brothers and sisters. Yeah, been pretty independent. I what guess. was that like? To be honest, it, it never really bothered me that yeah. much. I guess growing up. I was very involved with uh, my mum's side of my family. Mm. And we had a lot of cousins kind of closer in age to myself. Mm. But at the same time, like being an only child, I guess it meant I formed a really, really strong relationship with my parents, yeah. um, which still stands just as strong, I'd say. Nice. But also like a few skills, like one um, I noticed actually working at school in the playground was I guess it is a form of independence. But because you had like a lot of downtime and no brothers and sisters to play with and things you were very good at at ways to entertain yourself with with what you have so i remember we had this dodgy like netball hoop in the backyard and i'd come up with like my own sort of shooting game where if i got it in from x amount of steps back it would be worth a certain amount of points and or if i rebounded it off another part of the house like you know all all these (laughs) things came into play Mm. i played soccer with myself in the netted trampoline that we had kicking the ball against the net so just those little things um that come in handy now when we're in the school and sometimes have limited resources to do (laughs) things i'm like oh yeah yeah i know how we can try and make this situation fun and things but um yeah, overall, really enjoyed being an only child, mm. really enjoyed um, traveling with my parents. and um, But also, yeah, like a couple of my cousins in particular, that they, they'd all be like sisters to me as well. They used to stay with us weekly too. So, mm. yeah. Wow. Man, uh, I think one of the most, well, I wouldn't say the most tragic thing, but I think a sad thing today is is the um, is when a child says they're bored. You know, it's like, man... Mm. I wish you would see my ice cream container hoop <laughs> stuck to my carriage yeah, and yeah. my wrapped up piece of paper. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And and all these other things that we used to have, like you would make, you know. Yeah, it was like, I just think, man, I, 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 what's happening there in that space oh, with, with young people? It's so hard. Like, uh, that is so true. We um, went on a school trip up to Cairns mm. and we're doing the most, we're exploring the most amazing places and you know there's an hour or so of downtime and the kids say we're bored yeah yeah and it's like it's it's pretty heartbreaking it's like this is totally you know exhilarating and and the things we're seeing are so out of you know our ordinary Mm. back back at home but you're still bored you you know we did when we um went on long drives we looked out the window Mm. yeah (laughs) yeah yeah. (laughs) like man it was actually fun it was no, oh, yeah. I looked out the window. 
Mm. And there was nothing wrong with it. No. Because you like, you discover things that you remember seeing and then you'll see the changes mm-hmm. and then make up your own story in your head. I did that all the time. I yeah. you know what made up my own stories. Yeah. yeah. Make up your own stories, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, I'm really good at that. Jibber jibber is my, my thing, <laughs> you know, and, and I love to make up my own stories in my head and then convince myself that it was a fun game, yeah, you know, yeah. to do. Look, you're right, like I, I like, you know, with, with my sons, you know, mm-hmm. we play Heart Compass. So we, we play the Heart Compass game, you know, if we take them out, you know, for a drive. Yeah. And um, to somewhere they have no idea we've been to. Yeah. Uh, and then I just say, hey, look, um, it's time for you guys to get us home. I will turn in every direction that you will tell me wow. to until we get home. Oh, wow. So, so there's the call of the heart compass game. Wow. Um, so your heart, son, is going to be our compass to get us back home. And, um, and look, up, you know, play that, that game. That, that's something maybe, you know, peeps could try doing to like, because I know they get bored, eh? They get bored yeah, real quick. Man. Yeah. Like, I would have driven my dad to the KFC drive through <laughs> That says, <laughs> peace be <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> That's a pretty cool game. Oh, it's been, been a while since I've played it with them. And, you know, obviously the older boys, he's, he's going on a bit, you know, whatnot. But I, I think That's maybe cool. it's something like, especially when you hear like you're out in Cairns and they got bored. Like, you know, you're out about and you're bored. Yeah. Man, I love trips just to be yeah. at mm. the trips, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and I don't care if we're doing nothing. I'm sitting there going, I am not at home. Like, yeah. you know, I'm not in our hometown and this is all new to me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Yeah. Bored, bored. I don't necessarily like blame them for it either. I because yeah. yeah. you know you've shared that game that you played with your kids, and I remember like my dad would always come up with these silly quizzes when we did road trips, like classic, like okay, think of a capital city that begins with C, yep. and then you know until someone could not think of any any new ones. But I know that not all all fathers or not all parents you know g- give their kids that time or, or even want to have that creativity to to face mm. of boredom so instead it's just phone ipad and mm. off you go so i think that's a big problem that i've yeah come across yeah look i'm i'm good there too sometimes you know mm. like you know we're going to go for a long trip and it's like uh, uh you know oh dad are we dad are we? yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah. are we there? How far are we? Um, mm. Can I have your phone? Dad can have your phone. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. think it's always a tragic thing. I, I totally think there's a space for it. Yeah, but look, I think I, other, well, some families might not have any other option but to mm, but silence, yeah. you know, a kid with technology or, yeah. or just to distract. It's probably a better Ab- way. Look, absolutely. And, and, and the last thing I want to do is, 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 uh, is, is Don, you know, um, you know, families, you know, parents or, you know, aunties, uncles that, you know, hand the devices over because yeah. you know what, you, you're right. You know, there is space and, mm. you know, people do it because, you know, sometimes they need to, there is no right or wrong way. Yeah. Uh, and it's just about the way we approach, you know, what we do and, and mm. you know, try not to frown on the next person, you know, saying, oh, you know, I could have, you know, I don't do that. You should do it like this. Yeah, it's like, yeah. no, you don't have a blueprint to my life. So yeah. how about you stick to your blueprint? And we'll just high five and still get to. It was actually game. like uh, what uh, one of our guests was saying. Um, you know, five plus one equals six. But yeah. so does three plus yeah. four plus two. Yeah. Like there's, man, that was such a. That's that, my head, eh? That I was, loved that, yeah, eh? That was really good, man. Yeah. Like there's, a, there's different ways to get to the same answer. Yeah. And like you can't fault one way over or you can't sort of. Yeah, each to their own. But I, I love how you. Um, and you mentioned the the t- and the and the, the you had with your mum, and you know, yeah, I met your mum, hmm. and so uh, I contacted your mum, and uh, <laughs> did you actually? <laughs> and uh, I asked her for some photos. So do you want to have a look at the screen there? <laughs> I just wanted to see <laughs> your face <laughs> one more time. <laughs> the sad reality for me. It takes me back to when it was a happy place, yeah. and, and, and you know, and the last time I was at a, a Super Rugby Grand Final was when the Blues won it last. Mm. You know, back in. <laughs> Many, many moons ago, many, yeah. many, many, many moons ago, and I thought, yeah, and you know what, we got plenty more to come. Yeah, it was almost a happy place last year. Fifteen wins on look, the trot, and look, then uh, yeah, look, we we roll with the punches. <laughs> but the fact that I thought, like, because we had the players, man, back mm. in two thousand and two, two thousand and three, and I thought, you know what, we're, I think we're going to be celebrating for a while. Yeah, little yeah. did I know, <laughs> right? Mm. And two decades. It's like the Bledisloe. The greatest series when, like, you, you think of Queensland, right? Like, and the or- I don't think of Queensland often, but when you have to, you think of that eight, <laughs> like eight years in a row. Mm. But then you look at the All Blacks, twenty-two 
22 series back to back, man. Yeah. Come on. Look, I'll tell you what, my son wasn't happy uh, about the last game because he's, he's a Wallabies fan. Was he? He's a Wallabies fan. He's embraced the fact that. Too much device. You know, he's, look, he's, <laughs> he's embraced the fact that, you know, he's, he, he's grown up here. We had the conversation, you know, he was mm. growing up here. Um, yeah. he, he understands it. Um, he like, goes, Dad, I've, I've, I've been in New Zealand like for seven years of my life and I can only remember three or four, you yeah. know, but mm. the rest of it is all here. And I was like, okay, well, you know what, son? That's, you know, the Wallabies, you know, you go ahead. So, hey, we embrace it, right? We embrace the changes and we embrace everything else. So, That's exactly right, yeah. Um, sorry, look, I digress going, you know, throwing that in, in there, but like, He's going to know what it feels it like to be like a you're, supporter. You're, you're processing it. <laughs> you I, am. Like it. I, I, I am it still like processing you're it. Trying to convince yeah. yourself by telling you, it's like a soliloquy. <laughs> isn't that what you're we like, do? Isn't that isn't that what we do when we like tell other people and then we say, "Now they're you're really like, happy about it." Oh, hang on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you repeat it to yourself enough times, <laughs> it'll be okay. No, it's fine, man. Like, and it probably helps us jump to the next part. I know that we talked about how this might go, but. You're an avid, oh man, I wouldn't even say it's a hobby. You have an obsession with running. Yeah, it probably has crossed that line now. It's yeah. an obsession, man. And we talked about this, about a potential push towards serious running. Hmm. Like, you know, and you're being very uh, realistic about your chances and the dedication required. Tell us about your running. Yeah. Because... Yeah, tell us about your running. Yeah, look, yeah, just just before you start, I just want to know because I don't know how to run yeah. for fun. I, I yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's crazy awesome. Yeah, and that's fair enough. I couldn't, <laughs> like, honestly, I couldn't <laughs> run a bus. Anyway, <laughs> tell us about your running. Um, basically, uh, Dad and I each year we used to do like a boys trip once a year. So um, and generally it was just a long weekend. But when I turned 18, we decided to do a more serious one or – you know, a bit further and farther. So um, we came across to the Gold Coast from Christchurch and we had a week on the Gold Coast together just hanging out. And uh, that weekend, as we were planning it, actually aligned with the Gold Coast Marathon weekend. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Timing. So like we didn't really follow running festivals or anything like that, but obviously when we looked at what's on in Gold Coast when we were there, we saw that it was on and, and mm. how the scale of the event as well. It was going to be huge. So my mum almost said as a joke, like, huh, oh, you should sign up to do like the 10Ks or something. And I was, I'd actually just quit from my soccer team after like nine or 10 years. I was relatively fit, but I wasn't part of a sports team anymore. Didn't have anything to really keep me going in, in health and fitness unless mm. I had the natural drive to go to the gym like four or five times a week. Mm. So having that end goal of a 10k that signed up for and paid for was pretty much all the motivation i needed to to get training and i remember it as clear as day i i had like the training app it put together a plan for me and it started off with things like 2k jog around the block two days off 3k jog wow. around the block and stuff wow. and you know what like i couldn't even walk after these runs, <laughs> two and three Ks, I'd yeah. be, I, this was when I was looking at Countdown, I'd be walking around Countdown like a stick figure because my legs could hardly move and everything. <laughs> and so I, I was really discouraged, to be honest. And then I'd see a 5K coming up in my training plan and just think like, no, I don't want to do it. I'll do anything except that. Anyway, I just sort of, I pushed through it as best as I could. There was quite a lot of uh, run, walk, run, walk, cry sort of yeah. period but anyway i think it was about 10 weeks to prepare for that 10ks and um managed to do it with dad there which was really special shout out to dad yeah absolutely yeah. Oh, they've been the best mum and dad have been the best support crew for running um but awesome. yeah did that 10k um and and just love the whole experience of it had oh we moved to australia the following year Ran just casually in Melbourne, but played more like indoor soccer, indoor netball and things. Yeah. But then we had lockdown and I was locked down in a uni halls of residence. Um, we weren't allowed to go more than 5Ks from Damn. where we lived. Yeah. Um, obviously all gyms shut and everything like that yeah. for, for almost the whole year. So um, basically all you really could do was walk or run. 
Um, so the amount of hours I spent at the Monash Uni running track, which was a perfect 1K loop, mm-hmm. um, I, I probably couldn't count. Um, but yeah, that was when I really got serious about it and um, did my first half marathon was the virtual Gold Coast half marathon that year. And you just had to do it in your own neighborhood, upload it online and, and that was that. So yeah, wow. that was sort of how it became more of a serious. And that's what, 22 Ks, 21? Yeah, 20, 21.1 for a half, yeah. Okay, so I, I got to ask, if I've half marathon and a marathon. Okay, mm. so what? So what's the hint about what, what it is? So, so why do they, okay, just let me know what it is about a marathon as opposed to a half marathon yeah sure so as far as road running goes marathon is sort of the pinnacle for fast road running you can do ultra marathons um like on on trails and things um but it's generally considered almost like a different sport someone uh, recently described it to me as like swimming in the ocean versus swimming in a lap pool in a lap pool you're going for time and you're going for consistency and things, whereas the ocean, you're battling the conditions around you and you're constantly adapting and probably moving a little bit slower. So as far as road running goes, marathon is like the peak. Okay. Uh, so that's what, because <coughs> ultra marathon, marathon, half marathon, surely people are like, nah, I, I run the marathon. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, the marathon seems to be the one on, yeah, people's bucket list and, and things like that. So I love the half marathon. It's it's my favorite race, favorite di- um, to run because I feel like I can really push myself um, and probably not have to dedicate like such a huge chunk of my life to training for it, um, but just have a really good time and not feel totally wrecked. Yeah. Whereas when you go beyond that of 30, 35 Ks, that's where you have to go for something probably bigger than just your physical fitness alone. You know, you have to count on mental strength. You have to count on the crowd around you if you're in that yeah, race yeah. environment and also way longer training periods. So I think what I love so much about the marathon in particular is like even if you're in a field of like 5,000 runners, say like your average sort of marathon field, everyone has a story to get to that point that could probably be worth putting into like a Netflix miniseries mm. and stuff. Oh, the no. things that they've had to give up mm. to train, hurdles that they've had to overcome, you know, like what if you get sick in the middle of your training block? What if you get a random injury? What if, um, you know, you're running for a particular cause or something like that? Mm. Everyone brings something different and across that, you know, three to seven hours that all 6,000 people are running, that whole story is sort of unfolding and kind of no matter what time you end up with when you cross that line, hopefully everyone has that same satisfaction of, wow, you know, the last 16 weeks and the sacrifices that I've made and the work that I've put in are all worth it. And to me, that's what sets it on another mm. on another level. Wow. Never ever in my life had actually thought it that way. Like, you know, you go into this with so many things that you have on your back, mm. right? And you going, getting past that line means that, you know, everything that you've got on the back, you can just drop it right there and go, there it is. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you know, when I think ther- marathons, I think I'm tired, mm. you know, you now just watching people run, you know, and you know, the whole idea of like, you know, why why would you choose to run for the fun of it you know uh, you know the, the the fun run you know that that yeah that yeah. part but like to hear you say like you know the stories behind it the stories there you know and the fact that they have a journey outside of just that mom- moment you know in that marathon like that marathon is a part of a bigger journey yeah that absolutely. they've they've brought to it and I love how you put that in there because I never would have thought I never would have thought and, you know, and I got to ask, like, you know, with the journey that, you know, the people, I hear about the, the, the thing that they call you hit the wall, mm. right? Like, like I hear about it, yeah. you know, and I, I guess with, you know, now just hearing like something that you've, you know, that resonates now with me is like that there's a journey that comes with it, not just the event itself. There's, there's a story. Everyone has a story. You're building and you're working on it. And then there's the wall. Mm. 
please, can you elaborate? Uh, to, have to, you ever hit the wall? It's a pretty nasty wall. Yeah, I've hit it twice. Actually, wow. so, yeah, I've run three marathons now, and two of them I, I pretty majorly hit the wall. And basically, what it means is, yeah, it tends to be anywhere from thirty k's forward. Generally, the excitement of the event and the adrenaline and the fact that you know you've got yourself to a good physical point will get you through the first twenty five k's, no worries really. Yeah. Uh, but getting to that wall you know 30 k's you've pushed your body a long way to get to that point and then you've still got the mental hurdle of i've still got 12 kilometers to run further Mm, than this or or, or 10 kilometers yeah and and, you know that's no no small feat in itself it's hitting the wall is but a physical thing where your body's just like nah i've had enough like you know we're going further than we have in training you know i wasn't necessarily built for this sort of thing and then it's also that mental barrier of wow now i'm counting down kilometers but it still feels like a massive chunk of the cake that i have to eat wow um so yeah it's a really difficult thing to to push through but i guess a lot of the the advice i've been given to really you know trust your training you haven't put in 16 weeks for for no reason and it has built something within you that can climb over that wall and also um yeah to think of the end goal and you know your own personal reasons for for getting to that finish line and and as horrible as it is um it does become all worth it yeah and um my personal example of that was in sydney last year um i'd actually had a sprained muscle uh on the inside of my foot for for the whole race and it, it sprung up two days before the marathon after training for like 14 weeks. It was the most frustrating thing ever. And I kept trying to deny that it was even there because I was like, there's no way I'm pulling out of this thing. Yeah. But the last six Ks of that race were just agony. I'd run 500 meters, stop, stretch, run another like 200 meters, stop, stretch. And I'm running like my foot is almost on its side. I'm not running through oh, wow. my foot. I'm running on the side of my foot. Wow. And wow. I, I called my dad and I was like, dad, I'm struggling so hard. Please just pray for me for this last six Ks yep. and things. And, and him and mum were, and I, I hobbled and, and got there to the office. Wow. Wow. And um, yeah, it was so horrible at the time. Wow. but obviously in hindsight it was um a really mountaintop moment mm. i think so wow oh. so f- running on the side of your foot mm. what was your brain telling you and what was your heart arguing with you you know because it's just i can't imagine ever running on the side of your foot for even like two meters yeah yeah so um my brain was telling me like this can't seriously be happening like you you've trained so mm. like I, I was pretty much injury free for training had a far better build up to my first marathon yeah and then a big part of my brain was like are you serious like how has this happened the day or two beforehand to have a sprain and like the most crucial muscle of your foot mm. to propel you forward similar sort of thing to what i just described like that yeah. first 25 k's most of the adrenaline yeah. and hype and didn't really bother me too much but then yeah that that last six or seven on the side of my foot it was probably really bad for it first of all like you know running incorrectly just as an invitation for more and more injuries and yeah. other parts of your body but basically my mind w- was telling me like you know you've got to get the get the reward for for all the hard work that you put in and um you know this pain is is really bad but at the most not taking you out of this race and yeah. and even if you do have to cop it and, and not make the time you're after or things you know it's worth persevering persevering to finish yeah. did you make your time yeah i did, did you, did you beat I last really time? Made yeah. It. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i i think i i knocked 22 minutes off my previous marathon no uh, way yeah mm-hmm. yeah which was just <laughs> that that was uh, we're running on the feet from now on <laughs> yeah I, I, I thought that when sprinting like you know I'll go yeah. ksk, ksk, that will get me faster but no more oh, yeah. i'm running on the side of my feet <laughs> yeah i don't know if i could recommend that I, i'd say i was in the wrong shoes that was the main problem oh, but okay. too tight in the midfoot but uh yeah no nah, I, I wouldn't recommend it it was 
learned a lot from that race. So yeah. 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 Did you have another question? Jeff? No, I'm, I'm running. No, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm still trying to break down how you run. And now you're saying like, you know, you made your time. You know, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> hold on, it's been happening to me. <laughs> right. I've just made a personal best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, awesome. it was a real roller coaster that day. And but there would have been a real depth that you had to reach into. Oh, and, yeah. You know, was this was there like a, a certain you were reaching for? Like, would, like, yeah. I I think that point where I I like I'm totally I hardly even let me run a marathon. Yeah. The fact that I went on to my phone to ring my dad and say, "Can you please say some yeah. prayers?" That's for crazy me. good. Um, like that was so unusual for me. Um, cause yeah, I, I'm like, why would I look at my phone when I'm focused on, on this job? So brother, were you adherent? Because I can't even walk and talk. Yeah. Huh? Like yeah. I'm on the phone, like I'm with you, walking. man. I'm with you on there. And I'm like, huh? yeah, yeah. No, I think I was pretty coherent. I actually wow. like, cause my, I don't live in the same place as my parents. So we, had, we call on the phone and I often do that on runs. Mm. So I guess I had a bit of practice, okay. um, talking and running as well. But yeah, I think that point was where it, it even wasn't like, oh, you know, just depend on your training, just depend on your strength and the food mm. that you've eaten. It's like you're going to need something bigger than this yeah. to get you through yeah. these seven Ks. It's going to be more than painkillers. It's going to be more than, yeah, your fitness. You know, something more is going to help wow. you get through that. So yeah, wow. Which which brings us to the next thing, um, Dom, because I know, yeah, uh, yeah, you're a you're a man of faith. Well, talk to us about that. Like you, uh, your faith brought you. Well, I guess the journey of your faith and your walk with Christ brought you to Queensland. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, take us through that. What? Why on earth? Which probably is most people are thinking. Why on earth would you take a gap year mm. and then dedicate yourself to serving? Uh, Queensland is now nah, uh, serving, <laughs> serving people up here in Queensland on a mission, like you know, without any promise of reward or payment. Or what what brings you to that point? Of? Yeah, that that was a really um, crazy period. And I guess the the one sentence summary on it is God has led me on the most phenomenal adventure, really, mm. with some real high highs and some real low lows mm. as well. But um, I guess coming to that point specifically around relocating basically i was doing my undergrad uni in melbourne i loved it um i a lot of my closest friends are still there we're all really on the same page within my degree we're, we're all quite big thinkers quite globally minded loved um seeing the world transformed i guess um but i guess the flip side of that you know there's great academic growth and i guess great personal growth and, and adapting to a slightly different culture from New Zealand and being in that halls of residence with 200 people from around the world mm -hmm. and things like I grew immensely in that process. But on the flip side, there was some insecurity that I guess I was dealing with in that place too. Um, I really wanted to be on, on the front foot socially, I guess. So I cared a lot about what other people thought of me. I like to take the lead, um, but at the same time, I would do whatever was socially acceptable in the group I was in so that I'd be accepted into that group because I hated the feeling of, of being rejected from a group. Mm -hmm. So in Melbourne, in a halls of residence environment, that does look like a lot of drinking. Yeah, way more than I could have even imagined myself doing when I had the idea of moving to Melbourne. Mm -hmm. You know, you can envision uni parties and stuff, but not drinking at the level that, I realistically was mm. um, a lot of a lot of talk that with my mouth that I probably wouldn't be super proud of, um, and trying to find a lot of personal value, yeah, and and parties and status and relationships, things like that. Um, so even though it was sort of this adrenaline rush at the time, and most of it was new experiences, and I, I'd lie if, I'd be lying if I said like I wasn't having fun because. I was having fun mm. at the time. Yeah. But then I guess in that lockdown year, um, which was my second year in Melbourne, so much of that was stripped away. Um, even within our own halls of residence where we had access to 24-7 socialization with whoever we'd like, mm. that was taken away because you could only be um, in, well, only have two people in one room at any time rather than 19, mm. 20 and things. So basically we we all became very low in that situation 
everything mm. we held dear was now gone and we had to find a way to deal with it. And, you know, I, I was still a man of faith in that environment. I, I had my Christian faith. I had my beliefs. I was attending online church. But at the same time, the way I was dealing with my problems was going across the road with everyone and, and drinking until we were so drunk we wouldn't think about what we were mm. really going mm. through. Yeah. Um, so it was like this crazy cycle of like euphoric high, massive low, and then church and God and my tough questions for God somehow blended in to all the, well, right in the middle of that. Yeah. Um, I remember going for walks around that same 1K oval and praying like really sort of angry, confused prayers mm. to God. Like, why am I feeling this way? And, you know, how come a change in circumstances like this has left me so rock bottom? Because realistically, like it, it did suck, but losing um, the ability to have 20 people in a room is not the same as not being able to put food on your table mm. or, or losing your job or, or living in extreme poverty or something like that. So that's what my head couldn't wrap around. It's like what I'm going through is not too bad, but I feel like my world has, has ended sort of thing. So anyway, um, I realized that was really unhealthy. I wasn't happy with how I was reflecting on myself. So I knew I needed a change because I wasn't honoring my faith with the actions I was, I was doing. So... I guess I was praying to God about maybe a change in environment um, or just whatever I needed to, to get my faith to a position where if I did face a sort of crisis, a real crisis mm. later on in life, um, would I be able to properly deal with it or would I turn to drinking and cheap thrills and stuff yeah. Yeah. to you know the same result again and again? So I was trolling through Instagram and saw the opportunity to join a missions organization in Queensland pop up. And, you know, I was like, I like Queensland. I ran my 10K there a few years ago. <laughs> and um, we've always enjoyed it as a family. So I just put my, I think I just put an expression of interest on Instagram. And then um, within the next couple of days, the director of this program contacted me and we got the ball rolling on me moving up here. And that was a tough time because I'd, I'd uprooted from Christchurch. I'd really put my roots down again in Melbourne and the depth of um, social connections I made. And I had the idea of being there very long term. And then all of a sudden, two years later, I was looking like uprooting again. So as those conversations got more serious and as um, I guess the time drew nearer of me coming up to Queensland, mm -hmm. I think it was this weird mix of like hope and despair. Like I was despairing leaving these connections mm, yeah. and still pretty stuck in those same patterns of drinking my problems away and things. Um, but also hopeful that, you know, oh, perhaps next year being removed from this environment, I'll be able to sort this stuff out. So push came to shove. Um, I, I drove away from Melbourne physically in my car to where my parents live, which is the border of uh, Victoria and New South Wales. And I arrived there and I just sat on the couch and I just burst into tears. Wow. And wow. I joked about it at the start, like it takes a lot to get me emotional and, and it really does. I think the yeah. time I cried before that was my dog dying. Yeah. But I was just wow. so... Was it the dog in crash? Yeah, 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 wow. same dog. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah. Wow. Um, so I cried okay. then and then didn't cry for like three or four years and, and then leaving Melbourne, yeah, had this really sad outburst mm. and um my parents and i sat around the the dinner table and we're weighing up the pros and cons like oh should dom actually go to queensland is it, is it safer that i stay back there because the borders were all changing all the time with coronavirus and it was actually my mum that pretty much came through firmly and said you know you have made a commitment to this organization i had said yes you know if if it's dreadful it's one year and you'll you'll grow from that so i wasn't saying yes like to that and I wasn't like oh thanks mom that's exactly what I needed to hear I was yeah. more still pretty devastated but then drove to the airport the next day got the plane up here and then started this adventure in Queensland so yeah that's pretty much how I got to that point wow wow I, 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 I love how how mom and dad right like you know the the, the, the way you guys are the way I were with mom and dad and 
how they have been a part of the journey to you know you know to where you are now yeah you know that that's a great wonderful thing you know you know you know that you have someone corner or you know some people in your corner that'll be just your ride or die and that's it yeah and then that, that, that's amazing so you know when you flight and you made it here then um how was mum you know how was mum to her after you landed like you know when, when was the next time that you then called mum and how was she when, when you guys spoke yeah i think she was she was proud of me because she wasn't um an easy decision i think she was also pretty heartbroken herself but putting up a really strong front because you know her only yeah. boy had suddenly moved nearly two thousand yeah. k's away and things as well so we still joke about that to this day um but yeah i, I remember i got put up in beanley um, and I thought I was going to be working in Central Gold Coast um, at the time. And basically, I didn't know what church I was going to be working with. I didn't know what school I was going to be working with. It was total like blindfold as to what the year wow. was going to hold. And as someone who loves to plan things out and know where I'm heading, that was so stressful. And I really struggled through that. But I guess um, looking at the last three years and where I'm at now, I can see God's hand was was over that and it still even gives me shivers <laughs> talking yeah, about it. Yeah. But yeah, where where I've been led, particularly um, with this, has just been um, a phenomenal time of growth personally mm-hmm. in my relationship with God and uh, yeah, overall, I guess. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, 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 that's, some, that's a massive realisation to come from the moment when you were walking and then you had an epiphany, if you know, well, maybe where you were like, I, I'm pissed off at the world, you know, uh, I can't be in a room, you know, with more than, you know, 20 people. Yeah. And now I'm stuck with, you know, with two people, you know. But the fact that you recognize, like, why am I pissed off at this? Mm. You know, and, 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 and then... Surely something must have been, to, you know, to have that epiphany, right? Mm. To, to, to have that moment when you're like, who am I to be thinking this way or to be, yeah. you know, that that's a moment. That's a oh, yeah. moment that, that, that I'd, li- I'd like to, to know, like, you must have pissed off at something mm. Mm. other than just that, you know, the because that, that that's massive to the end. Uh, I'm a ch- Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not... I'm not change the person but i want to change my mindset yeah and my heart flow tell me about that like how you look back at that now and that person that was you in that moment as opposed to the person that is is here now going yeah and i'm glad i see mom and dad and yeah that's a really awesome question and it's actually something i've been thinking quite a bit about over the last um few days actually i think the reason i was so pissed off was like i was i was pretty much throwing tantrums to god when i'd walk around this field Mm -hmm. i'd listen to like real heavy rap music and be like the world is so unfair against me and what i want to do right now Mm. and i saw some of the behaviors of my friends in the hall and uh, like you know they didn't have the same faith background as me and there was there was no reason why they shouldn't have that way but i could see how it was having some unhealthy effects on their life and I was like, I've got this faith. I've, I've had so many good people build into my life, yet I'm handling this whole thing just as, I guess, miserably and, and mm. not being okay with myself a, as anybody else. Yeah. And in a few conversations in the last few days with people, I remember the moment that sort of flicked the switch on the entitlement that I had was when I was 16, my one of my best friends and my mum went to a local church on a Friday night and a guy called Noel who's the um, compassion country director for the Mm. Philippines spoke and he threw all these statistics at us as a Kiwi you know middle class audience basically things like if you're if you drove yourself here tonight and you enough change to buy a coffee on the way home or, or a snack on the way home, then you'll be in, you know, like the top, top 10% of, yeah. of wealth in the world and things. Wow. 
Wow. And I was, <laughs> I was never self-aware like wow. that at that point. Mm. And, and so I think a lot of entitlement sort of came crumbling down. And like I said, when I was in that hall, I, I was having those thoughts. Like I'm not in a position where I can't put food on my table. I'm still studying a university degree despite these restrictions and things. Yeah. Yet, you know, someone my age in, in another place, regardless of what they want to, might never have that opportunity. So wow. it was a combination of all those sorts of things that, that led to that moment like, come on, Dom, you need to make a change here. You, wow. need, to, you need to grow up a bit. That's massive. Yeah. Mm, that's massive. Wow. <laughs> Talk about it, Jimmy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, oh, quite a, yeah. it's quite a sobering experience when you, when you realise the score, you know, mm. on the end of a 100-point drubbing in a rugby match, not even a basketball game, but in a rugby match, and then you realise the score. We are, you know, we have the wrong perspective in life and, and um, you do you do sober up when you realise, hey, I've got more than I actually um, care to think about. Yeah. But mm-hmm. my mind keeps wandering to the things I don't have. Like we're, we're that people, like, you know, and, and yeah. we've got to really keep ourselves in check every day. Absolutely. I still get caught out by it pretty regularly and I have to... Yeah, come back to mm. those sorts of experiences. Things, yeah. yeah, it's a fine line, man. It's a fine line. Um, I guess um, the next thing I want to really talk about, and you touch on it, is your work with com- compassion. And um, t- tell us about that because, man, they're a world – well, are they, they're an Australian-based organization, but they do – yeah, I'll, I'll let you explain what you do, but you're an ambassador for compassion. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think the two things I could probably talk about most freely and passionately in my life would be running and compassion, I think. Mm. Yeah, Crusaders? So, Crusaders? Oh, yeah. Oh, Crusaders. Crusaders titles between, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's enough. The Razor era, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Richie Moong is X Factor. What's with the Richies? Yeah. I know, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so you're right, Irv. Um, compassion has a really significant base in Australia. Um, and Australia is described as, I guess, a donor country. The head office is in the US, but obviously it's like US, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Korea, um, which is a fascinating one. I might come back to that. Um, North or South? South Korea. Okay. Yeah. So Compassion actually started in Korea from a Wesleyan missionary um, who noticed how many kids were being displaced within the Korean War. So um, obviously a lot of Mm. orphanages set up, um, a lot of kids starving a lot of kids not receiving education um and and feeling pretty hopeless obviously if your country's in the middle of a war Mm. so this missionary he not only was he passionate about sharing god's word but he also had that sort of entrepreneurial mindset like how can i utilize the the capitalist system back home for the benefit of these in south korea and the way he sort of developed that idea was into this child sponsorship program Um, And it was in the sense that someone in America could make their donation. They could um, receive letters from the kids. Um, They could obviously see the kid progress over a number of years and even perhaps go and visit these kids one day as well. So I guess in the donor mindset, it's like, okay, I can get something out of this. Like my money is going somewhere really tangibly worthwhile, Mm. but it's also meeting an immense physical and spiritual need. So it started in South Korea, but it's spread out to um, 26 countries now, South America, Asia, Africa. Oh, wow. uh, Yeah, across those three continents. Mm. And um, yeah, it's a pretty beautiful model because um, in high school and in uni, I was a geography nerd and a big part (laughs) of um, geography besides, you know, flags and capital cities and everything was, was figuring out why certain areas experience certain problems i guess why does one suburb of the city have um way higher rates of Mm. um people smoking versus another why um you know why is it the south of every city yeah yeah essentially like like so (laughs) almost (laughs) (laughs) like socioeconomic distributions Mm. uh, health factors education factors geography would look at why these things take place in, in certain regions. So 
obviously um, international development and poverty is, is a really big thing that we look at in geography mm. and across two years studying at Monash basically the answer was poverty is extremely difficult to solve because it is a cycle you if if you are generally in an impoverished country it's it's very difficult to bills it's very difficult to uh, get your job where you're in a position to have sustainable provision for your family mm. and generally if um, a difficult circumstance pops up you need to borrow money mm. and in borrowing money generally not from someone very reliable interest gets whacked onto that mm. and you can never pay it back and then you're indebted to a not very trustworthy person mm. so and then obviously that debt flows onto your kids flows onto your grandkids and so on and so forth so it's it's ex- it's an extremely difficult backpack to take off, I guess, or, or cycle to break out of. Mm. So what makes me so passionate about what Compassion does through this sponsorship program is that it, it essentially exists to snap that cycle by breaking one child free from it. And it breaks that child free from it by um, providing for them physically with, with food, mm. good food, rather than just whatever's available, yeah. with education, with health if required, and also, um, I guess, Christian discipleship as well, mm. spiritual formation and things like that. And the belief is that if it is broken for this child, then it is broken for all the generations mm. that Ahead. go yeah. beyond it. And so even though people could say, you know, oh, why would you sponsor one child when you could spread your money a bit more broadly across a community project or things like that. Community projects are great, but they don't necessarily break the cycle of poverty. You know, because someone has clean access to water now is obviously a crucial physical need and there is a place for providing that, Mm. but it doesn't really help the person that is trying to pay back the loan shark and trying to put food on the table for their kids and get an education and things like that. So that's that's what makes me super passionate about it. And um, I guess... Yeah, I mean, well, God's faithfully provided for me to support some kids uh, from my very first job at Burger Fuel in New Zealand. Burger uh, Fuel. Yeah, Fuel. Burger wow. Fuel. Wow, Burger Fuel. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so good, eh? The uh, barbecue bacon road spout out there. Ring shout out, out Burger Fuel. Fuel. <laughs> Love the uh, ring burner. Yeah, oh, you like the ring yeah, burner? Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Bacon backfire with barbecue sauce. Very good one as well. <laughs> but yeah, uh, uh, Burger Fuel. <laughs> Is it in Australia? It's a, it man. was, not yeah. anymore. What? What? Why? It's because of the bacon they put on. Because you can never put burgers, man. That's just what, what? bacon yeah, and burgers is. It's it's blasphemous. But see, oh, I don't know about the that. Face of this man. <laughs> you know, bacon and putting bacon in burgers. You know, it's just it's as wrong as. Where do you put bacon? You put it in the rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're a complete <laughs> no bacon policy. <laughs> no, no, no. Only when it comes to burgers. Oh, like, okay. Look, I love bacon. I love bacon, just not in burgers. I bacon's carcinogenic, eh? I think too uh, much. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Bacon is yeah. bad for burgers. That's all I know. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> convince me otherwise. When it's in a burger, you know. <laughs> otherwise, on its own, it's carcinogenic. Yeah. But no, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not putting a it in a burger takes out yeah. the carcinogenic factor. Yeah, yeah. Wow, so um, Burger Fuel, so that was yeah. where you, oh wow. Started there and then uh, Guzmani Gomez here in Australia and now um, the school that I work for. Did you lose uh, any of these jobs or did you? Uh, nah, never lost quit. one. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. Burger Fuel was my first one for two years. Yeah. Someone took a chance on me. Seen all famous? Yeah, all Who? the black caps uh, came through Ooh. two nights in a row. So uh, yeah, made all Trent Bolt, Tim Southey, Kane Williamson's food. That was, I was freaking out that night. I was so happy. And then all my other workers like could not give a crap really. Disrespect. Is Kane Williamson shorter than you? Yeah, he is. Yeah. He yeah. is? He's and, powerful. and he's got that like kind of squeaky voice. Like, Bacon my burger? Yeah, yeah. Lovely guy though. <laughs> I, I served him yeah, the two nights in a row and was was uh, fanboy. Two nights in a row. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they ate up. It was in the middle of a test match in Christchurch. Oh, wow. So that was really cool. And we had another big team come through but no one was quite like the black caps that was mm, that was really cool yeah. yeah another big team that's awesome because bolt's playing in um the, the american um cricket league over there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. They, they make mega money yeah was it was it is it new york was he for oh look sorry oh i'm not too oh, sure yeah, yeah. yeah. I saw that. it was a bit of a f- if it was flailing for a bit 
But yeah, nah, but it's like it would take off because I was mm. like for season I sat there and I was like, oh, channel surfing. <gasps> Boat. I'm watching this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, nah, they're all good dudes. I, they seem to be really down to earth. Though. Awesome, bro. Sorry, I, I digress. <laughs> but so, so you went through you know, your roles there and now you're here and embracing it even more so. Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess bringing it back to the whole sponsorship thing, yeah, what started off with, yeah, a kid that I sponsored through Burger Fuel, there, there were times of where, yeah, I had spaces without jobs or without... Mm. I'm a source of income coming in, but I've but I believe yeah, God's always provided for me to provide for these sponsor kids yeah. um, without having to you know beg anyone else for money yeah, and yeah. things like that as well. And um, now kind of stepping more towards the teaching profession and things, seeing mm. the progress that these kids have made in their in their academics and their relationship with God and through some of the trials been through in their lives as well mm. has been one of the most inspiring things for me ever mm. as a person nice. i think so yeah yeah and it's wow. crazy yeah like some would argue because tom you're, you're quite an intellectual person and all the argument has been with faith um, you know that uh, you know the alignment of faith and science and mm. all this sort of stuff have you ever struggled with with uh with that sort of proposition like has anyone propositioned you about about um and it not being aligned with what intellectual thought and you know, that sort of mm. stuff. Have you ever felt challenged in that? Yeah, definitely. But to me, faith never comes more alive to me personally than when I can make a strong connection between intellectual thought and what I know of in the Bible and what I know from personal experiences of my own prayer life and things. Mm. And an example of that is um, thinking about, say, behavioral addictions and things mm. in the bible um you know there's there's verses say for example like flee from sexual temptation you know don't even go the door to the house of this temptation and things like that and, and there's all these scriptures that line up with say god's view on behavioral addiction whether that's a sexual thing whether that's drugs and alcohol whether that's mm. you know a behavior another behavior pattern so there, there's all these things that the Bible talks about on that front. But then say, for example, the other day I listened to a podcast from the ABC, obviously, you know, not biblical Christian organization, mm. but they were delving into the research on behavioral addictions and the amount of connections I was able to make mm. between the findings in that research and these scriptures and my own personal experience and faith having that intellectual side and the spiritual side come together mm. just to me highlights the legitimacy of, of what is said in scripture. Mm. And personally, I haven't necessarily wrestled as much with the whole idea like, is God real? Uh, you know, how do you align that with um, evolution and dinosaurs and things like that? Like that hasn't quite piqued my mm. interest that much. But for me, it's really been like, um, through a lot of social issues that are within the world right now, mm. through personal struggles that I have, through like in that halls of residence, seeing how my friends live mm. and um, sort of the results that was having and then thinking like, okay, well, if I lived wholeheartedly in a Christian way, what would be the difference between our lives? Would it be, would it have favorable outcomes or would it not? So yeah, examining Christianity, social issues, mm. some level of intellectual research and things like that as well. That's what makes it come alive to me. Mm. Um, probably right. more so than an emotional experience or or I know some people like totally resonate with Christian music or things, but for me it's generally, yeah. So it's very much yeah. the science is catching up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely. exactly it. Rather than the other way around. Well, hey, look, uh, I... <laughs> I don't know if you guys have heard about it. Um, sorry, I'm just... So I have came across this thing where scientists, you know, have been saying, long saying, you know, for for long saying, yeah, there you go. They've been saying for a long time that, the you know, the, the, the universe is expanding, mm -hmm. right? But apparently it isn't. Apparently scientists are now coming back saying the universe is actually moving in one direction and they can't explain it because what that means is Something has to be pulling them, the universe, in one direction, not outwards, mm. right? So that wipes this Big Bang theory, right? You know, this big explosion. There was a central and focal everything point else is going like this, right? Yeah. 
But mm. instead, they're saying, look, now they found evidence that the the galaxy galaxy is moving in one direction towards something, you know. And and so, look, I just threw that in there because you know, mm. with science and science catching up, it's like, well, you know, they actually asked the question like. It just makes me wonder, like scientists, the scientists that were looking at it were like, like something is pulling it in one direction. And you then kind of go, well, if you can't explain it, <laughs> then it's already, be, you know, it, you actually can explain it. You're just not willing to go there, mm. you know, in, in that sense. Because there's only one force, really. But that's coming from a mind. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, with faith. Yeah. But, you know, if it, it's going in one direction. Yeah. Uh, I just thought I'd put that in there. Jibba jabba, it works, guys. Yeah, it's good, man. <laughs> you know, it, you I know, was waiting right. for the Harry Styles reference. I was like, "Is this guy for real? Like, is he gonna chop her?" No, no, no. Look, and look. That's I, what makes I, you I've, I've had, I've had my moment because you guys dropped them. Thing, that, <laughs> that part. I can, I, I can't get past it. I cannot get past it. <laughs> but do you have burger? No, I ask for it. No, no. Room? Like you know, I, I refuse. It is blasphemous. Anyway, <laughs> we, we can taste on that like a time. But I just wanted to say, just real quick. What I loved about what you were saying, and 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 I think the thing that that I sort of um, that I picked up what you were saying, and, and why I think works for you, um, like uh, you know, being in compassion and the way you see it, is the moment when you had the epiphany and you had that moment and you saw where you were at and you saw how your mates were mm. and how they were doing what they're doing, but you didn't go. Ah, oh, I don't want to be a, you know these guys. You didn't. You didn't say that. You didn't. There was not. There was never a moment when you bowed um, into the equation. The only came into the equation was you. Then go. How am I gonna you know change the way I think, right? And 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 that for me, just seeing that's why I think it works for you, and and that it's something that because you've connected with you being the best that you can be, you know. And the bit you can want to be and you achieve because these are things that you are fighting for you, mm, right? Mm. And despite seeing all the things that go on over there, there's no judgment here. They can do whatever they want to do and it is what it is. Mm. But I'm not going to go, I want to do this because I don't want to be like you. Yeah, I want to do this because I think there's so much better that I have that I want to be able to pull out and just, and that's why I think it works. And, mm. and, and throughout this conversation that we're having, that's you know all I could think about was, Back to that, and then seeing how you this connection with, com, you know, with compassion and and why it works, and then you brought it up again, you know, a little bit later, and you're talking about seeing your mates, and then and still you didn't bring that through, and then I was like, you know what, that's why I think that I, I believe that is why because you didn't look outside and go aha, you looked inside and went aha, yeah, you yeah. know, and, and and I think I think that's where that that part is in, and look, there's kudos to you, you know, with Thank that, you. and 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 I think. Like, you know, with, with people that you deal with and people that you work with, that would make it even, you know, a lot a more hundred for them because it's a genuine hundred for you. And I think a, a lot of times a lot of people don't have that genuine hundred mm. and a lot of them um, are, are doing it because they see other people and they go, I don't want to be them as mm. opposed to, you know, what, I can be this person, mm. you know, because too many times we do things because um, we are judging someone else's character. As opposed to just doing things because we want to be that character, yeah, you know, absolutely. And and, and kudos to you with that. So thank you, thank man. You. That, that, that's an amazing journey, you mm, know. Thank and, you. Well, it's still going, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, just please get rid of the bacon. You too, brother. It just <laughs> takes it to the next level. Yeah. Oh no, I don't. Yeah. Ever since I, anyway, I don't want to put people off bacon. <laughs> but um, man, so you've got um, just to sort of close things. Um, Close things off tonight, I guess. Uh, wrap things up because obviously you're 23. Yeah, 23, and you've packed all of this living in this short space of time, and um, you're uh, finishing off your degree in teaching. Yeah, yeah, and you'll be heading into the deeper, uh, deeper, darker bits of 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 Queensland. <laughs> um, yeah, so you're gonna be a teacher. Yeah, yeah. The question is. Why? Oh, why? I think teaching really ties together a lot of patterns within my heart and a lot of experiences that we've mm. talked about into one role where I believe I can function really well to make a difference in someone else's life and hopefully 
use what God's given me to to help someone else out. Mm. And I guess um, for me, throughout high school um, and even my first year of uni where I wasn't doing teaching, I got told several times by a few key leaders in my life, like, oh, have you ever thought about teaching? Like, is it something that you'd like to do? And I was always like, eh, no, nah, probably not. Probably not. Even my own dad, who, mm. who I'd almost trust anything with, was like, to be a teacher. And I was like, no, nah, no thanks. I, I've got it figured out. I'm going to do my geography degree. I'm going to hopefully get a pretty high paying job within the government. I'm going to fix urban planning problems, maybe some of that <laughs> poverty stuff as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, live my life in that way. That's how I'm going to make my difference. Mm. And I guess um, as part of taking that leap of faith and coming up here to Queensland, like working in a church and working in a school was never on my radar. I was more here to to get away from what was going on in Melbourne rather than the fact that I really want to work for a church and I really want to work for a school. So those two were sort of like maybe added bonuses, but they weren't the core reason why I came up here. And it was actually just in that first year of working in the school, uh, there was something about the way that I was working um, and the drive I had to keep working, you know, putting in hours and at home, like Irv said, you know, I wasn't getting paid for the work, but I still had such fulfillment from doing it and such a drive to do it to a high standard wow. that I thought, oh, maybe this is something that I really should mm. investigate, you know, as like a calling thing or, or you know, seriously reconsider the, the path my life is on professionally. And um, yeah, there's several key experiences. Like one was with Irv up in Cairns on this camp. It was just phenomenal. Yeah, I can't even put it into words. There's a whole nother mm. story. But just several confirmations like that in that first year that was like, yeah, this is this is 100% a door you should walk through. Nice. And um, even in the process of, a, of um, different degrees and things, just the right doors opened at the right time and, and someone wise told me that, you know, every every light is a green light with God until he throws up a big red one. Mm. <laughs> I'd had quite mm. a lot of red lights thrown up on different parts of my life um, at that stage, but it just felt really nice to confidently go through some green ones. And uh, yeah, teaching's, teaching's challenging. It, it involves a lot of people work, a lot of intellectual work, mm. um, a lot of development as well. All, all those three things I'm super passionate about and I don't love any one in particular. Like I, I couldn't see myself doing intellectual work 24 hours of the day. I can't do pastoral work 24 hours of the day. Mm. But if I can combine all those things into that one teacher package, then hopefully most days I'll, mm. I'll really love my work and, and really nice. enjoy it. So. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Man, bro, you have, um, yeah, you've really like a lot on, um, or invited us into this journey <laughs> thus far. Yeah, and, man. Um, man, I've seen you grow like in stature massively, like both spiritually, physically, like in every every way, like you could measure someone in the last couple of years. Like it's been, it's been amazing to watch. And, and, and I guess from a parental perspective, it's helpful about my own children and you know what what god can do with who just is able to just realize it from an early age the greatness of god and 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 have this idea to submit and see what he does um so yeah yeah man it's been instilling at the very least hope in me as a parent oh right that, uh, you know all is not lost because you often hear oh man I, why would you have kids these days mm, mm. look at the world oh, around yeah. us mm. You know, um, and you know. Ultimately, yeah. the decision isn't ours to make anyway. Uh, God is behind that. Just yeah. as breathing is not our decision to make either. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's another podcast as well. <laughs> and, yeah, it's uh, been a few of those I would say. Yeah, like, yeah. Look, yeah. If you want to make God a laugh, big intersection, just tell him yeah. you have a plan. <laughs> yeah, well, man, that's yeah. that's profound. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I haven't heard that one before. You know, th that's the best joke anyone can tell. Yeah, God. I've got a plan. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Like I said, I still do it and I do feel God laugh at me quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I feel you on that one, brother. Yeah. I, I think he's laughing at me yeah. every day. <laughs> Man, thanks for thanks for joining us on the podcast tonight. I, I hopefully I know I know for sure it'd be some aspects of your story and your journey and um, that people would have picked up on 
And um, is there anything sort of in closing? Like we, we, we provide this opportunity because you know the medium of, of the internet and YouTube. Mm. Mm. And so, um, you know, your kids in this time might be looking and, hey, what did, what did dad do in this podcast? <laughs> podcast pops up where it looks like you're being, you're being mugged by these two dudes. <laughs> and so laughing you know, about rugby with a couple of mates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, with a passion. Why did you um, sit in the room with them? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you ate bacon? <laughs> Why did you put bacon in your burgers, <laughs> Dad? That, that was the real left field. <laughs> <one. laughs> yeah, but do you have a... That's um, funny. Do you have something that you want to sort of say that maybe to, to your future daughter or son who might be scaling the internet and just go, hey, that looks like my dad. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'd i kind of come back to that that point I shared earlier, just about being such adventure mm. when, when you do it. God, I think. Um, you know, those angry prayers that I prayed around the oval, the, the prayers that I prayed with my dad in the tent, the prayers my parents prayed for when I was really sick as a baby and, and everything in between. And also the, the mountaintop prayers from, from some of those incredible high points of life as well. Like I really believe all those prayers, all those experiences will, will hopefully amount into, yeah, a lifetime that I can be proud of. And I guess more importantly, God can say, you know, that was my son and, and mm. he used the opportunities that were presented to him for, mm. for something really good. Yeah. And what I just love seeing is like, if it's baby steps, if it's massive steps, just seeing people take a step with God on that adventure. Mm. And as a chaplain, I'm blessed to see, you know, people maybe make an initial decision to follow God, but also people try to apply a verse to their life for the first time ever or to say their first prayer mm. or to, uh, yeah, just give something new a go. So I'd, I'd encourage my kids in the future, I'd encourage mm. anyone listening just to think about a step you can take on this adventure with God um, and knowing that, what, whether you are in that total deep dark position where you're angry with God and you're doubting and things or you are celebrating an open door that he's allowed you to walk through mm. like just enjoy his company and know that he's working on stuff so much bigger than us that's pretty man nice. that's pretty profound um Thanks, Tom, for... Um, yeah, man. Yeah. Thank you, bro. Thank you for sharing. With us tonight, yeah, man. No, thank uh, you so much for having me. I, I feel really at home <laughs> talking <laughs> with you guys. It's, it's and awesome. uh, just on that note, and we'll we'll celebrate it by watching this two more times. <laughs> and it's not what you think, man. Let's... let's. Uh, <laughs> we wish got, I had a slow motion. Are we going yeah. back to Lancaster Park in 1950? Oh, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> calm down. Oh, okay. okay. Yes. There, oh, oh, there it is. Beautiful. Oh. Ouch. Oh. Ricky was thinking, like, where did that come from? He's like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad I didn't say that. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, gosh <laughs> that was one more time. <laughs> I, I feel like, I feel like, you know, Scotty went. This guy puts bacon in his burgers. And now though, he just went cha ching. Look at this. Oh, Mom's oh, yeah. is like, thank you very much. Wow. See money. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Dom. Prayers up Dom. for Tate McDermott. Yeah, man. Yeah. Shout out to Scotty. <laughs> <laughs>